Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Fly Culture Podcast. My guest today is a well-known fly tie and photographer who has written and contributed to many fly fishing books and articles, won numerous awards and plaudits for his tying, and has just released a new book, Fly Time for Beginners, that I'm keen to talk with him about today. It's my pleasure to welcome Barry Ord Clark to the Fly Culture Podcast. Barry, great to have you here. How are you doing? Very well, thank you, and thank you for having me. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure, and we'll come on to it very shortly. But as we were talking off mic, you know, that I, I saw your book and really wanted, or your latest book, I should say, and really wanted to talk to you about that. But let's. Uh, what I'd like to do is learn a little bit about your fishing career and, and everything else that's gone down in your timeline as well, so I can get a sense and learn about um how the fly fishing and fly tying came about but first off we're and I know beforehand that we would set a time for this but of course you're in Norway um so our time differences were slightly different but um you're in Norway what took you to Norway to start off with my wife simple as that uh we we I was working in London as a advertising photographer uh, and we had an apartment in Notting Hill. My daughter uh, was five years old. My wife was pregnant with our son, and I had a little uh, studio, photographic studio, uh, about 300 metres from where I lived in Notting Hill. And we decided that with the new child on the way that we'd like to... Uh, sell the studio, sell the apartment, and get a bigger apartment that had a studio in it. Uh, and we were looking and looking. We found nothing. And on a Friday afternoon, my daughter came home from nursery. And we came in the front door. And as I closed the front door behind me, uh, Ten seconds afterwards, I heard a shot on the doorstep and I opened the door and a 17-year-old boy was dead on my doorstep with a hole in his forehead. Oh, so dear. we moved to Norway three days later uh, and I've been here 27 years. Wow. So that, that's basically that... uh, how, I, how I got here. And my wife's Norwegian, of course. So right. it, was a, it was a bit of a... a tragedy of course it was awful but uh that kind of uh made the decision very easy for us yeah yeah that must be well it clearly was life-changing for so many reasons and um as somebody who's lived in london as well i've not experienced it to that degree but um yeah i th that well i can't don't know really what to say about that that, that must have been absolutely horrific to experience yeah and it was terrible I'm... i did just to think that uh, my daughter was on the doorstep just like 25 seconds before um and it was a uh, apparently the police told us later that it was a drug related thing um but that would that made the decision uh, we'd talked about moving to norway it had been discussed, but because of my work, that was the most difficult part of it. Um, uh, but that made it very easy. So we moved, literally, my wife and daughter got on a plane three days later. I hired a truck, filled it with all our things, rented my apartment out and drove everything to Norway. So it was it was that quick a decision. Wow. wow. And, and I in April... We've been here 27 years. Wow. And did you settle quickly? I suppose having a, a, a Norwegian wife has made that a little easier in some respects as well. Was it a, a easy adjustment to make or did it take a little bit more time than you thought? Or was it no, it was, very, very I, I've been in Norway uh, for many years before that. Uh, every spring, summer and autumn, uh, fishing and hunting so I already spoke uh, basic Norwegian um, so it, it wasn't it wasn't the, the the most difficult thing to start with was work because I had to keep traveling back to London uh, but that's where 
uh, because I was an advertising and pop photographer. So I did a, a lot of pop work. And of course, there was no pop stars in Norway then, only ha ha. Uh, so there was no work for me here. Um, but that's what started my fly fishing career was uh, there were so many hunting and fishing magazines in Scandinavia with absolutely terrible photography. Um, and it always been a passion. Uh, so I, I, I thought I'll give that a, a shot. And it worked out well. So I've been earning my living as a, a, a fly fishing photographer mainly uh, and fly tying photographer for the last uh, 27 years. Wow, and, and I guess, well, you'd know, but um, it's such a photogenic pastime as well, isn't it, fly fishing, with from a casting point of view, from the beauty of the flies to the landscapes. It must be something um, that must be hard to tire of um, taking photos of. Sure, I, I, but I, the, the problem with it for me was that uh, I was constantly at work. I never got to fish. Uh, and if I was, and I, I was very lucky. I, and I've been invited all over the world. I've fished in over forty different countries, uh, in some of the most exclusive fly fishing destinations uh, that there are. Uh, but I always had to get the pictures first. So, if I was lucky, I'd get to fish the last couple of days or the last day. Uh, but still, I, I enjoyed it because I, I enjoyed the photography work. And it's very, very and we, different. And we were going to come on to this, but it, it seems kind of pertinent as well. That Have you seen those big changes in, or has it your work changed, given now that um, digital photography, comparable to how it used to be? That must have been quite a, a change to your work, mustn't it? Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, if you take uh, in nineteen ninety nine, I did uh, three and a half weeks in the Amazon, fishing at four or five different lodges with Malcolm Greenhalge, or the late Malcolm Greenhalge, I should mm. say now, um, and was magnificent, absolutely magnificent. But I shot three hundred and twenty rolls of film. Uh, these rolls of film were ectochrome, so they were 10 quid a roll at the time. They were 10 quid a roll to process. And not only that, I had to have cooler bags with me because of the heat to keep the film cool. Uh, so all that has gone. All that has gone. And I used Polaroids on my large uh, medium format cameras. I used Polaroid backs uh, just to check the light. And, you know, that's gone now. So it's, and Polaroids were like six quid each when I shot one of those. Uh, so that, that, the expense side of it has, has decreased uh, phenomenally. Uh, but also the other great change uh, is at the height of my photographic career as a fly fishing photographer, I was delivering articles to, to at least... Uh, uh, 20, 20 plus magazines a month all over the world. And five, six years ago, these magazines started folding. They started dropping like flies. Uh, and that's when I decided that I would have to go uh, more digital. So I'd make my uh, presence more visible on YouTube and through a website. And that was that was the absolute uh, changing factor for me, that these magazines I was working for. And now I, I, I had like 40 magazines I would work for, and I would deliver to over 20 a month, and now I have three that I deliver to regularly. So that has been a, also a huge change from, from the print side uh, to to the digital side, so it, it's uh, and and now I I last year I I bought the new iPhone twelve, 
the camera on it is phenomenal. Absol the video is phenomenal. Uh, so that, I mean, it's better than anything you can pay four or five thousand quid for. So it's uh, I'm over the moon with that, that. I can have that quality of video and camera in my pocket all the time. So that that has there's been monumental changes from from analog to digital has been phenomenal, and it's been great all the way. And it's interesting you talk about the magazines as well, because I guess that's been a function of digital in some respects as well, hasn't it? With the arrival of sure. the internet and everything yeah. else that's gone with it. And it seems to me that you move very quickly and at the right time, a well time move into and embracing the newer media. And, you know, you have significant following on YouTube and in other places too. But that must have been pleasing to get that just at the very cusp and the start of those things and understanding the potential of them as well, I guess. Sure. Uh, I was very, I, 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 if I'm honest, I should have perhaps started two years earlier uh, than, than when I did. But it's, it's, it's always easy to look back and think about what you should have done but it's good and I'm, I'm pleased with the response and I, I enjoy working in the medium it's uh, for, for teaching uh, YouTube is just phenomenal it you know it's like uh, you're giving a one-on-one -on -one fly tying lesson and of course supported with with the books that works absolutely brilliantly as so many followers on YouTube uh, that have said I decided that I was just going to watch the videos but I bought the book and I'm so pleased that I did it because it makes the videos a hundred times better and it really does because I get to explain the finer points um, and it, it's, it's the most fantastic uh, learning uh, medium and teaching medium it's just wonderful you can reach so many people yeah i found with uh, you know for years teaching people to fly cast as a living that very often you'd get somebody who'd read a tiny little bit of something but i found latterly towards the end that people i'm going wow this is this is nice casting and similarly they were looking at youtube and learning to cast from youtube as well um and I, I like exactly what you said about the book, though. There is something, and I remember, you know, when I was taking instructor exams and so I'd walk outside with a book and, and look at the pages and, and then come back in again and think about it a little bit more. But I think there is something about being able to pick up something physically as well as a reference. And sometimes it is easier. I know about watching something on YouTube and if you're tying a pattern or whatever it is, but there's still something nice that you can sit away from the vice, read that, get a good understanding of it, and then take that to the vice. So I guess it's a nice approach, almost a two-pronged approach to be able to instruct and help people via two mediums now. Absolutely. And that's where uh, the, the both are so perfectly juxtaposed for, for, for exactly that. And if you look at any uh, fly tying book, the step-by-step -step images, uh, no matter how good those step-by-step -step images are, and no matter how uh, precise the uh, text is, there is always a blank space between each step-by-step -step image where the reader or the student doesn't know what's going on. If you have some basic knowledge and the elementary skills of fly tying, when you look at a step-by-step -step, uh, set of images, you can work out what happens in these blank spaces between each image. But if you're new to the game, that can be absolutely uh, off-throwing, totally. You don't know what's going on in there because one image shows that and then the, you know, and it'll say fold over the, that material and tie it down. 
and the next image shows that material folded over and tied down. But how have they done that? So the whole idea is that they can watch me tie the fly, explain all the techniques and the material, and then they can go to their book and then they know what is happening in these blank spaces. So it, it really has, uh, and the whole idea uh, behind the book was to make it, uh, to make fly tying, learning fly tying from a book easier than ever before. And it's now possible with that, with that uh, YouTube support. Yeah. It's interesting. We've I told you we do go off in all sorts of directions in this and but we've come in via photography to your book and or your latest book, sorry. And it's called Fly Tying for Beginners. And this is I guess what we've been talking about with the accompanying YouTube video with the patterns. But having looked and read um the book, what I really liked about it was um, that it was almost as if you were talking to me about it in the in the text as well, and using um, the clink hammer for example, I think you mentioned it. It's one of the flies you're most often asked to demonstrate or explain, or and and I like the way that you go about the the text aspect of it as well. That works incredibly well yet you've got the the video side of it as well to help and that sort of brings me back to ask you a question about fly time for beginners which it may well be but you have patterns in there like the clink hammer there's terrestrial patterns there are but you know um f fly for example but it, it it strikes me as something that even somebody who's done a bit of tying would probably get something from um in that sense is that what you were sort of trying to pitch um along along the way there uh it's basically uh, at uh, from from the go get uh for beginners but there's loads of techniques in there that even an experienced tire will will gain from um and and what I also do here is, which is also very important, is uh, I've dedicated, I think around fifteen or sixteen pages at the beginning of the book, on materials, all the materials that I've used in the twelve patterns, uh, because it's it, I, I think it's of paramount importance when you're learning a craft uh, that you're aware of your materials and their possibilities with them, their capabilities and their downfalls. So I try to explain what to look for when you're buying them, um, how to use them, what you can't use them for. When you, when you have this knowledge and you gain an understanding of your materials, it opens all kinds of doors for you. And it makes learning time much, much easier. So that that is also a very important aspect uh, of of the book. And of course, the techniques, the ele what we call the elementary techniques, the basic techniques, uh, attaching your tying thread, whip finishing, uh, dubbing, all those are included with uh, videos to accompany them. So you don't have to look up a fly that has a dubbed body in order to learn the dubbing technique you can scan the qr code on the dubbing technique and just watch me explain uh five six seven different dubbing techniques and then you can go back and apply those to the flies that you're using or tying yourself uh, but the 12 flies are also uh very uh that they they've been chosen not only for the techniques uh that they require so the 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 student will learn a different technique or even two different techniques in every single pattern chosen in the book that they can then carry on to tie just about any fishing fly once those techniques are mastered and the 12 patterns are also extremely good fishing flies no matter where you are in the world 
and just about under moss any circumstance. So we cover I cover midges, caddis flies, mayflies, terrestrials, bait fish. So we cover most most situations and most insects. They're the common ones. So they have a great possibility of learning to tie flies correctly and catching fish with them. Yeah. Yeah. And was that difficult to to select 12 flies was that an easy or difficult task did you have to think long and hard did you think of it from it well it strikes me that you thought about it from a fishing point of view from a tying point of view and an all-around fly box as well was that a long and drawn out process to get to where you were with those 12 flies not a, it, it needed consideration uh, because uh, the techniques I wanted uh, to illustrate had to be within these patterns, and I did want to make them fish catching patterns, patterns that will work anywhere in the world for for, for fishing for trout. So, the, uh, and they're all internationally known patterns. They all I, I've caught fish on every single one of them. Uh, so, and I explained that all these patterns can be tied in different colours, different sizes, weighted or unweighted, uh, where necessary. So the possibilities, these 12 patterns suddenly become, once you've learned the technique, become any pattern you, you wish, really. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I wanted and... to stay away from uh, what many of the beginner's books do is like wet fly wings uh, or wet flies. There are so very few. I, you know, the, it's only really in the UK uh, that I know where people fish with wet flies anymore. Um, there are some in America, but fly tying has changed a whole lot. Fly fishing, as I'm sure you know, has changed very, very much Uh in the last, uh, in the, especially in the last decade, uh, with CDC and new materials, UV resin, uh, things have, have got, uh, and especially influenced very much in recent years by competition fishing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And th moving on to that very quickly, we'll come back to the book again because. Um, there's plenty to talk about there but you you talked about cdc and i know we were talking off mic beforehand and for me in my very humble opinion that and tungsten beads were probably from a fly's perspective two real game changers and i know you were involved um with cdc when it first came on the market at the very beginning um with your work with mark pettijan as well and what do you think they're my two, but what are your two game-changing materials? Let's say you said the big change in the last ten years. What what have you seen as the big change in the in the last ten well, years? Well, just that have been just game point, changing. Uh, go a little further on your point there with tungsten beads and CDC. When Mark uh, first published uh, his tungsten CDC nymph in a fishing magazine in France, he was ridiculed. Why on earth would you put CDC and a tungsten bead together, this great floating material uh, and these heavy beads? Um, and now we know that uh, they work absolutely beautifully together and they're a serious uh, threat to fish. Uh, but... It's uh, the CDC book was was a a, a, a labour of love really. Uh, it took us seven years to do the book, and when we started uh, photographing, started work on it. I mean, Mark came to Norway, I think for a week at a time, uh, for uh, I think for five or six weeks, five or six different trips, a week at a time. And we worked 12, 14, 16 hours a day while he was here on the photography for the book. And the first two days, we were just 
clashing heads. Uh, I was telling him what to do and he wouldn't do it because he said, that's not the way I do it, so I can't do it that way. And I said, look, just forget about how you do it. I'm talking about what I'm seeing through the camera. No, 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 no. No, they, I don't do it that way. Because I was saying to Mark, look, what you have to do is get under your vice and you have to put one hand up there and one hand there. So you're under the vice and so it looks like you're tying the fly POV. No, no, I can't do that. So we decided after on the second day, after not getting anything at all done the first day, that we would do one fly, we would photograph a whole fly the way he does it, and then we would do one the way I do it. And when I showed him mine, he said, OK, you're right, let's do them all like that. So Mark was... He's very locked in his ways, but as soon as he sees the result and he knows it's good, then he's fine with it. He's very accepting like that. Uh, so and then, other than that, we just kind of went through it and went through it. And it's been a lot of work, but it's a great book. And it is the, it's, uh, it's Mark calls it his legacy. Uh, and we've just updated it. Uh, but because of Corona, I had to do the tying and the photography for the new patterns. Uh, and he's removed, uh, uh, his uh, layout people have removed my tattoos from my hands. <laughs> so it looks like Mark's hands. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, the, uh, and it's, it's done brilliantly well for him. He sold 10,000 copies, I think. And yeah. he's published it himself. So it's uh, it's it's been a, a great, a great earner for him as well, which I'm very pleased with. Wow. And that speaks testament, doesn't it? 10,000 of a fly fishing related book is a big amount in fly fishing, isn't that's, it? Especially that, when it's 80 euros. Yeah, yeah. And that speaks volumes as well about the pat, uh, the material, how good it is. And w one of the things I wanted to ask you, actually, was that with... Um, these sorts of patterns and you talked about the nymph patterns and using CDC as a hackle and I remember years back Mike Weaver talking about using CDC as a tail as well many many years ago as well um, which oh. I tried um, a little bit as well but that that speaks volumes do you think though with the range of materials we've got now and the so many different things and you talked about the resins we've got so many things do you think sometimes, and I often see, as I'm sure you do, that this is the great new pattern, this is the great new pattern, but do you think sometimes we do need to um, owe it to the fish to learn about the entomology a little bit as well, in the sense of rather than tying a pattern full of trigger points or whatever it may be that doesn't necessarily resemble what a fish might be eating on? Do you think sometimes that element or that part of our pastime is is pushed to the side just a little bit or or we've just just embraced the change and and go with it in in some cases it it has been uh but uh fly tires are constantly looking for depending on how they tie and what they tie they're looking for new materials uh quicker ways to tie flies. Some fly tire, a German fly tire, contacted me a couple of days ago and he said, I've got this great idea. Uh, I want to use the male side of Velcro. And what you do is you glue it to the hook and then you can just stick whatever you want to, dubbing-wise, and change the colour of the same hook. He said... Uh, that he thinks that's a good idea is is fine by me. I mean, it does that doesn't work for me at all. Uh, yeah. But it's inventive. It's and it, and if he catches fish with them, it's absolutely fine. Uh, and you get you get you know fly tires, a fly fishermen are using these mops and tying these mop flies. And for me, that just doesn't turn me on at all. Uh, and 
but if you know whatever floats your boat if that's what they like doing and they're catching fish with it and they're enjoying themselves it's fine uh, and then you get some fly tires that go absolutely off the other end of the scale uh, and they're counting hairs on legs and they're so precise and super realistic they're using you know 30 hours to tie a fly uh, and that is also i mean i've done some of that and it's very it's craft yeah, and it's it's very satisfying and it's very relaxing uh but the traditional side is also i'm i'm interested in all aspects of fly tying really and i'm i'm learning all the time i've been tying 40 years and i'm still learning it never ever uh stops uh surprising me even you know all the shows i do I do about 20 international shows a year. And uh, even guys that have only been tying a year or two years, I'm learning from them. Absolutely fantastic. So when you get all these tires together and they've all got all these different ideas going on, it's it's never ending. Never ending. And uh, absolutely and it, fabulous. I, and interesting you bring up shows as well because um i've touched on it a little bit in previous podcasts and you know we have bffi which is great um and we've had several um come and go but i get the sense in europe that they become more populated um and there are real I, I was talking to one of my guests yesterday about Holland and what a hardcore of, of fly anglers there are there, despite limited um, opportunities, certainly from a trout perspective. Um, but do you sense that, you know, visiting all these shows, there's there's room for more in the UK? Or is that a function of perhaps a, a marketplace that, that isn't as big as it once was? Perhaps I, I'm not 100% sure. I'd love to know what you think. Uh, no, I, we've seen it here. Uh, the, there's a, a great market here for the outdoors, uh, hunting, fishing, uh, what they call Wilmarks live, uh, which is out wilderness life. Uh, everything from fishing to picking berries and mushrooms uh, to hunting big game. Uh, and... They've had lots of shows here, but the problem is that when you you get all these different shows at different times of year, but it's the same thing over and over and over again. So these shows just died out after a couple of years, and the one big show that is in Oslo has remained. Uh, and I think that's kind of the same in the UK or anywhere really. There are the, the, they've tried these events on larger scales and you still have a few of the shows like the game fair and stuff in the uk that work but bffi the british fly fair is absolutely you know one of one of the top european fairs if not one of the top world fairs for fly fishing and they managed to get you know uh, 60 world-class fly tires there to sit and tie uh, in their own time uh, and do fly tying demos which is a absolutely great puller for the crowds and the public uh, so no and uh, hopefully all being well uh, I'll be at BFFI next year but unfortunately I was I was hoping that we could do the Irish fly fair this year but uh, that's been cancelled and now I'm supposed to be doing uh, the first fair is in October 23rd which is the EWF in Munich uh, and that is the only one that I'm still on the cards for doing but I, it's probably going to get cancelled unfortunately mm -hmm. so the, the next fair will be New Jersey in New York in, in January or early February and then BFFI and uh, my favourite show of all in June which is the uh, the Sim Fly Festival in Castel di Sangro in Italy, which is just an absolute fabulous show, and and I, I get to do uh, I'm, again I'm very fortunate to 
because to do these shows because all the shows are uh i'm sponsored by veniard and mustad so uh, uh i fortunately i don't have to do it under my own expense so these shows are uh, and uh, if anybody uh, has an opportunity that hasn't been to one of these shows they must definitely should go because they are absolutely fabulous i can recommend them wholeheartedly a great day out yeah. for a fly fisherman or a fly tire and i think the bff i you know i've worked on stands for goodness knows how many years now and um i think this one when it happens will be a great gathering for everyone given everything that's happened i'm sure all of these shows are going to be similar but i think it'll be that little bit extra special won't it absolutely yeah i'm sure it will it's i was at the last one uh and i uh it was a bit of a corona nightmare actually uh i did the last weekend in january 2020 in Bologna, I had a two-day fly tying course at uh, 54 Dean Street, a great uh, Italian fly tying shop. And the weekend after, I was in Utrecht doing a two-day fly tying demo in the Netherlands. And then the next weekend, I was at BFFI. Uh, and that was actually... Uh, just as we started hearing about Corona, and I'd been to all the worst places, and I got home and I wasn't feeling good. But fortunately, it wasn't Corona; it was pneumonia. But yeah. uh, I, I was I was a bit worried for a short while, but it all worked out, and I just hope that uh, that things will, at some point, return to being somewhat m more normal he's hoping he's hoping so let's we've talked about tying we've talked about shows i wanted to get a sense of fishing and you said you fished in over 40 countries and do you have a a favorite species um this is going to be about a three or four part question because there's so much going around my head now is there a species that you prefer to target is there a, a venue that you love to fish the most? Um, what, what is it that really um, floats your boat from a fishing perspective? Uh, my original passion was, was brown trout. Uh, and they didn't have to be big. Uh, as long as they were wild brown trout, I was very happy with catching you know, six inch trout on a, on a two weight rod. Uh, but since I've moved to Norway, we have a, it, it, we're very fortunate that we have a, a, a little cottage on a island in the Oslo Fjord. And there is absolutely fabulous sea trout fishing there in the sea. So in the last, no, the last three decades, really, saltwater sea trout has been my as, as is responsible for I guess it's 80% of my fishing is saltwater sea trout and I love it because I can sit in the cottage in the sitting room with my binoculars and we're about 200 metres uh, uninterrupted view of the first bay and I can sit there and I can watch in the bay and wait for them to start rising and then I can just throw my waders on, run down, and fish for these beautiful sea-run browns. Um, I do still love brown trout fishing, still water brown trout fishing in, in forest lakes here. Uh, I'm 30 minutes drive from the sea, I'm 30 minutes drive from the mountains, and I'm 45 minutes drive from the fifth most productive salmon river in Norway. So I'm beautifully located. I'm very, very happy here in Norway. Uh, and the, 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 the destination, after all the countries that I've fished in all over the world, the destination that I return to absolutely over and over and over again is Iceland. 
no other country can beat it that I've been to. Uh, it's absolutely fabulous fishing. And you have all five species there, uh, sometimes in the same river. So you never know what's going to grab your fly. Uh, it's fantastic country, a very dramatic landscape. And uh, the fishing is phenomenal. And it's not far for me. That's another good thing. And they speak English and some speak Norwegian. So it's good. It sounds as though that's a lucky coincidence of where you live. And I often say that about where I am here in Devon between Dartmoor and Exmoor. And it's a lucky coincidence, you might think. And um, uh, sea trout in the sea. My One of my closest friends lives in Denmark. So I go once or twice a year for six, seven, eight, nine years. 10 years now and okay where's that I, can, uh, I was last I was over in Fun um, yeah. he lives uh, Fredersborg yeah okay so yep. yeah so I fish around there a fair bit at uh, Eastenfjord um, yeah. which I absolutely love and I, I just think it's phenomenal fun stunning fish and it was interesting what you were saying about the outdoor. And I, I was thinking when you said that about Norway, Denmark's very similar. And, you know, I'm usually over there November time. We certainly definitely go in November and we've been going summertime as well. Um, and I've not forgiven the, the first hornfish I caught as well, which was absolutely horrific. It made a real mess of my line because I knew... Oh, I didn't know much about them, and it just twisted and twisted and twisted. Um, but the outside there, and I always use Denmark as an example, because we turn up there, it's November, it's cold, yet Eastern Fjord, there's people everywhere fishing. And they may be spin, yeah. they may be fly, and that is that sort of more outdoors thing. And I, I don't know if it is a less dense population which allows people to go out into these places i'm not 100 percent sure um but i always notice that that so many people are out fishing and enjoying the outdoors as a whole and i'm sure as you've alluded to norway and other parts of scandinavia are probably similar as well aren't they absolutely yeah mm. it's um uh very very popular uh fishing hunting uh, and now is the time for picking berries and mushrooms right now. And the hunting season kicks off properly in October uh, and finishes in December. So, uh, no, um, everybody is outdoors minded. I, the, Scandinavia has, I think, the most densest uh, uh, amount of hunting and fishing shops that you'll find just about anywhere. Yeah, there'd be. I know I've been into a few in Denmark as well, and very knowledgeable people, very passionate people, um, and yeah, f fantastic place to fish. And something that for me is something as a river trout angler and salmon angler, it's something completely different. Yet getting the chance to catch those great big cup of coffee and cinnamon roll to start the day, and it is fantastic fun. So absolutely but the, love the it. The great but thing. Do you? also about the sea track fishing the saltwater sea track fishing is that this started in norway i would say it kicked off really about 30 years ago uh, and since then what it's done is it's opened up a whole new season because everything else uh, is frozen and the sea can freeze as well but generally speaking, it's open for most of the winter. Uh, so it's not only opened up a new season for the fly fishermen and the spin fishermen. It's opened up a whole new season for the tackle shops. And the other great thing is that it's challenged the fly tire in the last 30 years for all these new uh uh, forage foods that the sea trout eat in the sea, like uh, shrimps, ragworms, uh, saltwater gammarus, uh, sticklebacks, 
all all these different kinds of crustaceans and and mollusks that the 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 sea trout eats are, are now are imitated with with flies and that has opened a whole new thing again with materials and techniques and patterns which is absolutely fantastic i've done two books in uh norwegian on saltwater patterns for sea trout uh and it's a, it's a it's a great thing it's a very very different kind of fly tying uh, and it's it's still different from salt water fly patterns in 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 the states or blue water patterns. So when you think about the 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 patterns for the Baltic and Northern Europe, it's interesting. Very very good. It's it's opened a lot of new doors for fly tires. I'm almost ashamed to say to you that it's the uh, I can't remember what the fly is called, but it's just that cobra something the fly is called with just the dubbing. Cobra bassin. Um That's it. Works fabulously yeah. well. It's a yeah. really yeah, good I mean, pattern. It's, it's just like a cobra cobra ice dubbing. Cobra uh, copper fl- uh, coloured ice dubbing. It's there's not much more, uh, but it works. No. And as, and I've, this is something I was discussing with somebody yesterday. Uh, we talk about, and you you saying earlier uh, that you were off to the spay and how many flies and fly boxes and stuff you're taking with you. Uh, we could actually, and it's the same with these materials we were just talking about, new materials. We could actually probably tie flies for the rest of our fishing career and still catch as many fish just with like a hare's mask or a pheasant skin. You could and, and fish for every species. You could manage probably uh, as long as you can tie in different sizes. And but uh, and, and uh, uh, John Gerak, uh, the American author, he very uh, aptly pointed out that uh, if you fish with the wrong fly long enough. It will become the right fly. So uh, we, you know, we, uh, a lot of the tying we do, we do is not out of necessity. It's it's the craft side of the fly tying that we all love. And it's the fun as well, isn't it? That a new season's coming, sure. or the grayling season's coming, and you want to tie up some nymphs, and that's part of the anticipation, I guess, isn't it? That we're we're all excited about going fishing. We better stock up with a few flies. Just, just in case. But like you say, I think it's Yvonne Schonard, isn't it, from Patagonia? Just fishes for everything, including bonefish, with a pheasant tail of of some form. And I think of yeah. the Jim Teeny's teeny nymph as well. Yeah, yeah. I know. I've caught. Uh, I don't know how many species on a pheasant tail nymph. Uh, tons. I even caught big pike on a size sixteen pheasant tail nymph. So it, I mean, you know. We could uh, we, we it, a lot of what we do is unnecessary, but it's fun. Yeah, yeah, that's why we love it. I think, isn't it? So let's go back a little bit. And where did this begin for you, the fishing and the fly tying? And I'd like to get a sense of that, and then where the the tying came into it. And if you remember that first fish you caught on a fly that you tied yourself, and if that was some form of a tipping point for you as well, that you suddenly that that was it, and you were you were literally addicted, I guess. I remember them very very well. All those occasions, um, I actually started tying flies before I started fly fishing, uh, and it was totally by chance. I'd I'd, I'd fish. Uh, I did a lot of course fishing when I was a boy with uh, a split cane, full ridge match rod uh, from very early age in in mill ponds in Oldham and Burnley uh, and the River Calder through the cotton mills in Burnley. Uh, but when I was living in London in 1980, working as an advertising photographer, I was at a car boot sale one day. And there was a Scotsman there called Gary. I can't, unfortunately, remember his last name. Uh, And he had stuffed fish and salmon flies in frames. And I stopped and I was fascinated. I, uh, just as a little background, I had a 
a classic arts and crafts education. So I learned bookbinding, calligraphy, uh, life drawing, painting, fine art, stained glass. So all those uh, uh, William Morris crafts. Uh, and I'd always had a great love for hunting and fishing and dead things. Birds, feathers, skulls, bones. So as a boy, I just collected these things and was absolutely overwhelmed by how beautiful they were. And uh, at this book, uh, at this, this uh, uh, boot sale, I met this fella and I looked at these uh, classic fully dressed salmon flies. And I got talking to him and I, you know, it came up that I was a photographer and he said that I'd like a brochure making. What would you charge to photograph my stuffed fish and my flies to make a little brochure? And I said, I'll tell you what, teach me how to tie these flies and I'll do the brochure for you. So he came round to my place and then we find out we only lived a few streets away from each other in Notting Hill. So he came around to my place uh, one night a week for, I think, about eight or nine weeks and taught me how to tie classic salmon flies. Nice. So that was my intro to it. And it wasn't at a t until, I think, two or three years later that I started fishing. Now, that was a, that was a gas. We talk about this all the time, me and my mate, uh, Martin. Because Martin, uh, my friend in London, he also was a coarse fisherman. And we said, we're going to have to give this fly fishing guy uh, a crack. So we went to an old tackle shop in the Harrow Road in London called Stanobs. And it was one of those absolutely beautiful tackle shops that you went in and it smelled of maggots and casters. And it had tackle in boxes from the floor to the ceiling on shelves. And there was absolutely nothing was organised, but he knew where everything was. So if you asked him for something, he'd get on a ladder and he'd go up onto a shelf or he'd go in the back room, he'd come back with it right away. Uh, so we bought a Shakespeare black fly, fly rod together, a fly line, some leaders, some flies and a landing net. We were very optimistic <laughs> and we bought these together. We were going to share them. So, uh, and I think it took about 20 minutes for me to buy him out uh, of me waiting for him to learn to cast. <laughs> so we, I think it lasted about 20 minutes. And uh, uh, we, we, and we fished together ever since and still do. So that's that we've been fishing together for like 40 years. <clears throat> and uh, I t started then tying my own flies. I remember... The first fly I tied was a Canadian pattern, a streamer called Hamill's Killer. It's either Australian or from New Zealand. Uh, and I was fishing at Walthamstow. Not Walthamstow. What was the reservoir called uh, by uh, Hammersmith? Oh... It's not the one they tried to reopen again a few years ago. Something weird. Uh, no, I, can't, I can't remember now. No, I can't remember the name of it, but it was no. there. It was That was like Walthamstow was Martin's local water and Hammersmith was my nearest water. And we were fishing there uh, and I caught, I think a th it was a three pound rainbow on that first fly I tied. And that was it. And then I just tied dozens of Hamill's Killer. <laughs> yeah. uh, and Martin actually started tying flies, but then he, he just fell away. It wasn't for him. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. and I just I just cracked on with it. I loved it. So that's, that's basically that. And that was it, uh, literally. And since then, I've tied absolutely thousands and thousands of flies. I used to tie commercially here in Norway, and I used to I used to supply uh, the big tackle shop here, 
not far from me, uh, 5,000 flies a year. And that's a lot of tying. Yeah, yeah. Wow. If Let me ask you something then. If uh, one of our listeners is getting a box of flies ready for obviously not those sorts of numbers, but they're going to go and tie a bunch of flies for their grayling season, let's say, as that's looming now, how would you advise them to prepare for mini production time? What's the best advice you could give someone? Uh, well, firstly, if if it's just for your own fishing, you want to keep it fun. You're tying. You want to enjoy your tying. You don't want to lose that enjoyment because uh, you can very quickly do that in production tying. It can uh, it can be a, a a real millstone of getting uh, that production ready for delivery. Uh, but if you're just doing for your own fishing. I would say have fun. That's the only bit of advice. Keep it fun. And you can do things. You can prepare your materials, you know, select your hooks, get them counted out, cut all your materials and sort them out. And that, that makes your tying quicker. And I actually like tying like that. I'm very OCD with my tying. Uh, I like to production tie for my own. When I'm going fishing with friends, I tie loads of flies and give them all away. Uh, and and I like to tie that way. I like to have everything ordered and and at hand when I'm tying, so I can just knock these flies out. And I like to make them all identical, absolutely identical, so you can't see the difference between one from another. Uh, but uh, the, the main thing is to keep it fun, because when it stops being fun, you'll stop tying. That's some good advice about lining up all the materials because mine take a Darwin-esque route. So they'll start one way and then I think, oh, actually, but uh, what about if I did that to it? But then if you've got everything lined up, like you say, everything's going to be the same, isn't it? And that's, I guess, not that people listening are probably going to be production tying, but it at least means you've got six or 12 of exactly the same thing so that if you're using them on the river then that one's working then you lose it you can replace it with the same thing and mine where they take a change that may not necessarily happen in in quite the same way so that's some great advice there one of the things i wanted to ask you was as somebody who sees fly fishing on a world arena i guess traveling so widely how does fly fishing look to you right now and I, I the reason i ask that is that we're told over here certainly that license numbers have gone up um and we've had this you know where people have been kept inside the the need or the want to get outside and experience different things tv program that's doing a wonderful job of promoting fishing as a whole as well but how's it feeling to you as somebody who is uh, talking to a lot of anglers in a lot of countries, how how does that look and feel to you right now? Well, I think I think fly fishing at the moment and fly tying especially is is having a renaissance. There are so many young people getting into it; it's becoming uh, trendy in a way. Uh, you, you can see that they're designing. Uh, wading jackets and waders now for for hipsters uh which of course we were never bothered with before but it's become fashionable gear and lots of, which is very nice lots of girls and women uh tying flies and fishing uh so th that side of it is absolutely fabulous i mean we, it's growing like nobody's business uh but of course th there is a, the the downside of th and we have also become extremely environmentally aware uh, with with barbless hooks and catch and release and uh, water quality and pollution uh, and then there's that side of it which unfortunately has got worse which with fish farming and and uh, agricultural off run into the rivers and and these water companies that are doing an absolutely terrible job of dumping sewage into our rivers and 
finding it easier to do that than paying a fine. You know, it's easier to pay a fine and dump it in the river than it is to clean it, apparently. And I, I just find that absolutely disgusting that that's going on. And we're, we're having to, to, to live with that and nobody's not doing anything about it that is, is capable of doing something about it. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, we've highlighted it on here and we've had Fergal Sharkey on here. Um, now, Fergal's about doing it very a great early job. On. Yeah, yeah. And what he's done and been a part of, and he's talking to outside of fishing as well, because I think what he's realised, as have others, is that we need one big loud voice rather than lots of little voices so he talks to the surfers against sewage um wild swimmers everything else and if we can all sing from the same hymn sheet and sing very very loudly it's going to be very difficult for them not to listen certainly in in this country and again with you know the popularity of the white house and um, mortimer fishing program that that's bringing fishing to the forefront and people understanding, and they had Fergal on there as well, which I think is great news as well. So my hope is that that momentum will continue. The fines are getting bigger here now. They still need to be bigger, and I agree with you, and I've talked at length on this podcast previously about these, that while companies can use those as operating costs, like you say, they'll keep paying the fines. So those fines have got to be bigger, and that's where I think the pressure needs to come so that the companies will invest in the infrastructure rather than just paying the fine as an operating cost. So that's yeah, me absolutely mini not. ranting. Mm. Yeah, I, it's uh, absolutely terrible. And uh, that, they, that they avoid taking a, a moral, or they, or they just won't take a moral standpoint on it. And they close their eyes and say, just pay the fine, dump it. Uh, and that's not very good at all. I mean, it's the in this day and age, it shouldn't be happening, especially with how poor our water is to start with. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This has been a great and interesting podcast. Um, and I, you know, the reason it came about was that I was sent a copy of um, Barry's book to review for the website. And I so liked it that I reached out to Barry and said, can we talk about it? Because I think it's a really interesting book if you're considering fly tying. It's an interesting book if you're looking to improve your fly tying as well. But also, I guess there's a companion to that, isn't there? The next step, would that be right? The feather benders tying techniques would that sort of lead sure, on nicely yeah. from the beginner's book as well. That's that's a, a, a the next stepping stone for sure. Uh, this in 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 the flight of feather benders fly tying techniques. The the these are a little bit more advanced techniques, but once you've mastered these elementary techniques in in the beginner's book. There is absolutely no problem with going on to the fly tying techniques. Uh, and then you're on your way to stardom. You'll have to watch out at the tying shows, I guess, in future. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And I will be, as I said, I, I do hope that I'll be uh, able to uh, do BFFI in, in February because it's the best show for sure. Yeah, so absolutely. I hope to see your, some of your listeners there. Yeah, I'm sure you will. I'm sure they'll, um, if they've listened to this, I'm sure they're going to come over and, and say hello. But I'm sure you know what a tiny, friendly community it is that I'm sure we all know the similar sort of people as well. But it's been wonderful. We've talked for over an hour now, and it's been wonderful to get a, an insight into your view on time, photography, so many aspects um if people are interested by what we've talked about and want to buy a copy of fly tying for beginners where do they get hold of it uh it's published by merlin unwin uh in the uk it will be published i gather next year 
uh, by Skyhorse in the United States and Canada. Um, but if you want to just order one online, you go to the book depository and it's only fourteen ninety nine. So it's a real cheap book. It's a hardback book. Uh, so it's it's a real decently priced. It's, uh, I'm bowled over by the price, actually. It's, uh, it's very affordable. And the great thing about the book depository is that they will ship it worldwide free of charge for the same price. And they also Brilliant. do the feather That's... benders fly tying techniques as well. So if you need it online quickly, that's the way to get it. Fantastic. And if people want to follow you on social media or websites or YouTube, how do people get a hold of you? It's very easy. Uh, on YouTube, it's The Feather Bender. And my website is thefeatherbender.com. And there's hundreds Fantastic. and hundreds of films and fly tying and fishing and all kinds of stuff there for everybody fantastic barry thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today i've really really enjoyed chatting with you and like i say i have no angle with this book whatsoever it was sent to me and i just thought wow this is really good for people if they're looking to learn about fly fishing so i've got none other than i'm a fan of it having looked at it i thought it was really really good so i wish you every success with that and um the others too um and thank you so much for being a guest on the fly culture podcast and taking the time to talk with me today it's been great pete thank you very much Thank you, everyone, for listening to the Fly Culture podcast. I hope you've enjoyed this one. And as ever, there will be another podcast very, very soon. But um, thank you so much for listening today.